Hello and welcome to the Sailing Lockdown magazine programme. <laughs> no, you're not going to call it that. No, we're not. Oh. No, we're going to keep it upbeat. We don't need any sombre stuff. We're going to keep it upbeat. Uh, although we are this week going to answer one question that a YouTube viewer put to us about where they think we're going to be in six months' time. Yeah, difficult one. Mm. Uh, also on this week's programme, we have Gardener's Question Time, <laughs> where we go over to Lizzie's garden aboard Esper. Tiny little vegetable patch. Yep, and she'll be uh, trimming her bush. <laughs> yes. Oh, charming. <laughs> And the other thing, because the main thing we're going to be doing is discussing the most essential tools you need on a sailboat. Yeah. But yeah. before we do all of that, here's this. Yes, what do you look like, Mills? Well, that was filmed a few weeks ago when we were in the first phase of the movement control order here in Saba, when we did a whole day in the life and it included lots of things which we can't do anymore, so it's kind <laughs> of irrelevant. But Millie falling in the water and waking us up can still happen and in fact did happen this mm. week. She's done it twice mm. in, in a week or so. Anyway, uh, on to the slightly more serious question, which came from our Patreon, Nick Fowle. He would be interested to hear our thoughts on what happens over the next six months or so to our lifestyle, i.e. relative freedom for crossing borders, for example. I, I think the first thing that we should say is that uh, what we're about to discuss is supposition only. It know? really is, yeah. I mean, we can only base what we know on what's happening right now. And uh, you probably all know this already, but Malaysian territorial waters are completely uh, forbidden to any international vessels of any kind. So we can't sail in Malaysia, the same in Thailand and the same in Indonesia. And Philippines. And Philippines. Yep. So pretty much we can't go anywhere, even if they were to release us here. We couldn't go anywhere. In fact, I think we could go to Brunei. You can go to Brunei, yeah. but it's a dry state. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, there's no marina there. No. Don't forget, of course, we've got changing weather patterns, and I think that's something to consider when thinking about the next six months. Uh, we've got friends in uh, the Maldives, for example. Yes, yes. They, uh, they went over to cross the Indian Ocean, and they got as far as the Maldives before they were going to be carrying on to Madagascar. But of course, it all hit. Um, they've been in the Maldives now for uh, about six weeks. Shame. Must be hard for them though, but it is hard because they kind of don't know what they're going to do next. Having said that, the Maldivian authorities have been fantastic and have said they've got a never-ending visa. They can stay mm. for as long as they like. So at least they haven't got that to worry about, but they have got the weather coming in. Yes, and, and in fact, that extension of visas does appear to be happening in yeah. uh, most countries in Southeast Asia, but uh, those changing weather patterns are a big con uh, concern. Um, but thinking beyond that, let's yeah. say things are starting to open up again yeah. and we wanted to continue on our journey, which is to go up to the Philippines and beyond. I think my main concern is how the administration and bureaucracy is going to change and in particular quarantine. Mm -hmm. Because um, for those who don't know, in our experience, quarantine comes somewhere down there on the list of checking in procedures. Yeah, it's it's normally Harbour Master Customs and Immigration. It's always a bit cursory, the quarantine. Yes, apart from Indonesia, yeah. who took it a bit more seriously. But I suspect that when we start moving around again, quarantine is going to be a much more important feature of checking in and checking out, getting a clean bill of health for the boat and for all crew. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing I could see be a potential, you know, yeah, and they might actually want us to quarantine. They might want us to do 14 days at yep. anchor or something like that. And who knows what, if any country is serious about trying to stop this spread, uh, I can't see that there's going to be any country that you can go to where you're not expected to quarantine immediately, mm -hmm. whether you come in by air or anywhere, because each country is going to try and protect its, its, its people. So, I mean, it is supposition, we don't know. Mm. To be honest, six months takes us to October. Uh, and we were planning to be here then anyway, getting ready to go to the Philippines and Japan next year, possibly also to America next year, maybe. So it's, it doesn't really affect us because we were planning to be in Malaysia anyway. 
But of course it does affect us because we might not be going to Japan. What happens if there's a second wave? And this time we've chosen to go ahead and we're halfway up the Philippines or we've left the Philippines and we're trying to get to South Korea, Taiwan or Japan and there's a second outbreak. The point I'm trying to make is that where we are right now, we are really fortunate. Yes. We're, we're in a great marina, we're yes. being well looked after, yeah. we're able to provision. There's, a, there's, an, there's an element of a safety net. There definitely yeah. is, secure, um, it's just brilliant. We're very lucky compared to many cruises around yeah. the world. But what were to happen if it all starts again and, and now we're somewhere far more remote? And of course we know plenty of cruisers who are stuck out at anchor, who are not allowed to go ashore, uh, one poor guy, solo sailor, it actually sounded quite desperate when he got in mm -hmm. touch with us. Uh, he, he was feeling lonely. Um, you know, as I say, there's people in far worse situations than us. Some of them are not even allowed you know, to swim. Yep. They're not even allowed to get off That's their boats right. at all. Um, and they, so they can't provision, they can't get anything. And what's really worrying is for those that haven't got water makers, they can't make water and they can't get water. Yep. That's something I've read about. So it's not on our tools list, but I'm bloody glad we've got a water maker. For sure. Anyway, I think we have uh, done this to death and we've got a bit gloomy, so... Let's cheer up. Let's cheer up. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go over to Gardner's okay. Question Time. Mm -hmm. This is a very British reference, by the way. BBC, yes. Radio 4. Okay, so this time, uh, this week's Gardner's Question comes from Esper's Cockpit. It does indeed. Where we're going to be discussing Liz's um, growth. Yes, didn't Bob Sox ask? He did, yes. Yeah. So Bob Sox, who's a YouTube viewer, but is also the admin of the Facebook group YouTube Sailing Channels. Trev. All right, Trev, nice one. He says, do you grow anything edible aboard, herbs, etc.? What about alcohol? Does Esper have a still? Well, unfortunately, we don't have a still and Gardner's Question Time does not cover alcohol, <laughs> but we do cover all things green. We do, we do what we can. Uh, just a word on the alcohol, rather than having a still, we just completely fill the boat with alcohol, in case you didn't know. The, the boat is the still. Yes, it pretty much <laughs> is. Uh, well done Delos, they've got a good still, I've sort of watched their stuff. Uh, so, in the past, we've grown basil. When yep. we're in the Mediterranean, we grew basil quite successfully. Yep. Um, but really haven't grown very much since then. We're always moving around too much. There's too much going on, boats doing this. You know, it hasn't been ideal weather to grow anything, but we got inspired. In fact, you started by chopping off onions and trying to get them to sprout. Yes. Left them in a dish for about a week and forgot all about them. They just rotted. But I thought, oh, I think it's a good idea. So pass me. Yeah, th by the way, this was inspired by being in lockdown, but really yes, it's, yes. it's something that we should be doing yes. anyway. So first up, we have <laughs> this. <laughs> so rather. Sad little specimen. Okay, so I read about taking clippings and putting them in water and getting them to root. And once you've got them to root, the leaves will grow and then you can use the leaves in salads and whatever. This is, I think it's parsley. We're not actually sure what it is. The nearest supermarket is hopeless for these kind of sprouting greens. And um, we even rub the leaves to try and smell it. And we still can't work out. Well, I think it's just very weak parsley. Uh, it, it? it is parsley. I'm not sure it's gonna grow, but I thought I would just try anything. Anything we pick up, we're gonna try. <laughs> Yep. There you go. Okay, I'll drink That's that later. Uh, the second drink is this one. Yes, so this looks magnificent, doesn't it? It's an onion, as you're all aware, and you might ask, why aren't we just eating the onion? <laughs> Which is what I asked after I did this. Yeah. And in fact, it, we cheated because it had already started to sprout, been in the onion bag for so long. But, mm. again, good old googly Google, I looked them up, and apparently what you can do is you can, you can grow your onion plant from your onion bulb, and, the, and this, these bits you can use, they're a bit like, um, we call them spring onions, like scallions, mm. put them in salads and things. So, you know, if I keep growing enough of these, I can just chop a little bit of spring onion. Yep. That's the idea. And that's great, it's got good roots. Yeah. It's like, what are the one. bulbs that you, you plant in glasses in January, in the winter time? Uh, Always used to buy it yeah, for yeah, mum's birthday present. Hyacinth. Hyacinth, yeah. yes. Okay, right, finally, this one is magnificent. This is my success. Yeah, so doing a bit of research, I discovered that chop off the bottom of the celery, put it suspended in water, so only about half an inch of it's in water, and you can shove it through with toothpicks to, to hold it, suspend it there. And look! Yeah, that's got in celery three days. growing. Yeah. And the other thing as well, the cockpit smells of celery. Yeah, it's nice smells better than a... your farts and Millie's stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we should get a whole load of celery. That's cool. it. 
So this is the beginning of what could be a great big cockpit full of green stuff. Yeah, so if you guys are growing your own stuff on board, I'd love to know. we'd I'd love to know, know all about it. How and do we, do it. We do know yachts that rather than hanging solar panels off the back of the boat, literally hang vegetable gardens off the back of their boat. So. I think it's all right if you're in a marina most of the time, you can do it, but For not sure. really our lifestyle, it has to be quite basic. Yes, yeah. Okay, so th that ends uh, this week's Gardener's Question Time, but we will be open for next week's episode. So if any of you do have any questions for Liz, uh, please let us know in the comments. That's that with. Now on to the, the, the main bulk of... The meat and potatoes. What we're trying to get to, yes. All right, and it's all about essential tools. So this is a question that comes from Travis Collier, uh, another YouTube viewer. He said, would you please do an episode on essential tools and gear... That's a really good question. And I think um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is going to seem obvious to some people, but perhaps to a lot of you who are looking to move onto a boat or just even want to just uh, a reminder of the kind of tools you should have on the boat. These are the ones that we're looking at. Now, by essential, we mean essential that we use every day. The very first thing that sprung to my mind is a socket set. With these kind of things, I think it's really important to have both imperial and metric yes. fittings because invariably your boat will be made up of both types of fittings. You've um, also got a mini one. Well, that's it. That's the other thing I was going to say. The small socket set, I think yeah, I probably use really more useful. frequently than the large one, especially for things like hose clamps, jubilee clips, yeah. debolts, that kind of thing. Yeah. Allen keys. Oh my God. Yep. We've got so many. We've got so many Drawful. sets. And again, same rules applies, imperial and metric. And try and get the long handled ones as well so you can get a decent bit of leverage to undo those really hard to get to bolts. And find a way of keeping the sets together because they invariably fall out. Well, I think that's half the reason why we have so many sets is because you lose one and then you need to buy another set yeah. to replace that one. Next up, a very simple tool, very nautical, of course, is a marlin spike. Oh. And this is something that we use all the time, especially when we're dealing with the uh, sails, trying to get the sails into the track. Marlin spike's very useful for that. Of course, it's mainly used for loosening knots and other rope-related work. Screwdrivers, got to have lots of screwdrivers, both flat-headed and slotted or Phillips screwdrivers. Um, lots of large ones, lots of small ones. I actually have a drawer of screwdrivers. Yes, you need a little short fat ones as well for some of those. Problems. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. Really, really um, small ones yeah. because sometimes you can't get a screwdriver into yep. that position. So again, lots of different lengths as well as sizes and thicknesses. Yeah. Number five is multimeter that's rather obvious. No. There are multimeters, multimeters though, aren't there? Some are better than others, is that right? Yeah, uh, there are so many out there. Um, for me, I think the most important thing, obviously, is to check your voltage. And by the way, as I understand it, if you are checking your voltage around the boat, you should always try and use the same negative, if possible, and the negative closest to the battery bank. Um, but I find that I'm using mine for uh, continuity to make sure that the two ends of the wire is the same two ends of the wire, because quite often you're running long cables through. Um, so you sw switch it over to resistance to check your continuity. So it's always useful if a multimeter has a beeping thing as well. Mm. So but number six is an, what I call electrical kit, like a stripping, oh, a yes. wire stripping kit. Uh, there's lots of different types of wire strippers out there, but quite often you can buy them as a kit and they come with tape. Ideally you should have both red and black electrical tape. Uh, quite often they'll come with a little uh, crimping terminals as well mm. and you want a, a crimping gun for those terminals. Mm. And you have all those different terminals and all those different sizes yep. and they just fall out all over the boat and I have to pick them all up. Uh, absolute rubbish. <laughs> oh and zip ties as well. That, yeah. uh, that actually was that going to be my next one? That is number, <laughs> that's another one actually, but quite often when you get those electrical kits, they come with the little zip ties as well for small gauge wire. At number seven, we have torches. Oh, and do this, we have torches? This covers a whole range of different torches. The main ones really is a good spotlight, a halogen or equivalent uh, spotlight that uh, you can plug in to 12 volt yeah, power yeah. so that you can actually see around the boat. Uh, we also have a cordless one as well with lots of rechargeable batteries inside it, six uh, AA batteries inside, so that's a nice powerful one. Uh, work lamp was another one I thought of. So yeah. a portable one that's rechargeable, that has its own stand yeah. that you can put in the engine room or in a cupboard, so it's an independent light. Headlights. 
headlight, headlight. absolutely, especially Underwater. especially one Sorry. with a with a red yeah. lamp yeah. for, for night time. Night. Yeah, and underwater. Night. An underwater torch, diver's torch, yes. essential. Yes, and you need to be uh, a torch when you're going ashore. Uh, for many of these islands we go to, there's no lighting on them at all. You've got, to, you've got to find your way to the dinghy and you've got to get yourself from the dinghy to the boat. Unless you've got a dinghy that's got a light on it, you need the torch because you need yep. to be seen as much you as need, anything. That's right, you need to be seen. Mm. Plus, of course, if you're taking the dinghy over coral, you need a nice white, uh, wide uh, beam that's going to you know, project onto the coral. Yeah, we do that yep. a lot. So I gave the gameway the number eight zip ties, <laughs> zip ties or cable ties as they're known. Try and get UV resistant ones if mm. possible, and again get lots of different sizes. And if it's not quite long enough, remember you can double them up to extend them to make them longer. Yeah. And do we cut them down or not? Because absolutely, some, yeah. yeah, always, always cut them down. Um, cut and you have to cut them right down to the uh, to the nub, as it were. Yeah. Otherwise, they can be really dangerous. Yeah, you can myself. slice your hands on those. So, so that's it. And then finally, um, an adjustable wrench. Pretty obvious, but uh, we use this all the time. In fact, we have two, a medium-sized one and a large one, and quite often we use it for tightening the bottle screws on the rigging, uh, but also useful. Very important, though, with all these tools is to keep them lubricated either with WD-40 or lanolin spray. Uh, try and keep them as far away from the bilges as possible, uh, just so they don't rust up, because they do rust quite quickly in the marine environment. Yeah. You say wrench, I say spanner. You're all American. <laughs> uh, I thought there was supposed to be a tenth. Oh, was that only nine? Yeah. Okay. You only got to nine. Um, oh yeah, right. I'll spoil you with two more then. Oh. Multi-tool. You can get mini multi-tools. In fact, I've seen some of the flat, pressed stainless multi-tools. Have you seen those? Yeah, it's like 18 in one, and it's just it's almost like credit card size, and it's got all these different uh, uh, tools on it. So I definitely recommend a multi-tool. Yeah, so the reason being is you can keep it on you wherever Precisely. you are on the boat. Yeah. Really good going up the mast or something like that because you, you haven't got to take a bag of spanners with you. <laughs> Who's the bag of spanners? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything else? Uh, yeah, right, sailor's knife. Yeah. Sailor's knife. I think the important considerations with a sailor's knife, for me anyway, it has to have a blunt end. Yeah. No, no sharp end because if you're in dangerous conditions, you do not want to be dropping that on your foot or tripping over it whilst you're moving around the boat. So it should have a curved flat end, preferably serrated, uh, definitely rust proof, and also a nice bright colored handle. Quite often you see them in yellows and mm. bright reds, just mm. so they're very easy to pick up and spot. Mm. Um, so yeah, and there's some amazing sailor's knives out there. There's so many nowadays. Mm. It's just massive. We had a Gerber originally, didn't we? In fact, we've got they, they do multi tools that yeah. are sailors knives and other tools. Yeah, so. I mean there's loads. Just yeah. pick the pick the one you fancy, really. Yeah, and by the way, all of the tools we've mentioned, we have put links in down below in the description. Uh, they're affiliate links, which basically means that uh, we get a tiny bit of commission on it, but you don't pay any more, um, and they're all links to Amazon. <laughs> and I just remembered there well, were two more that I wanted to include. Oh yeah, go on then. That so I this didn't... top ten is turning into a was that, more, more than top. Was that you know. or the ducks? Like, all I can hear is quack, quack, ducks. quack. They want to be fed. Yes, uh, would you mind passing me? Oh yes. Yes, all right. This. I've had this since we've had the boat. It's, the, the handle's broken, but it's supposed to have a little cup on it. And it's one of these extendable, it's got a cable in it, and pushing the end. And out pops this Dalek robot-like. We we'll use it on the ducks in a minute. Yes, be quiet. Um, really useful, especially when you drop uh, nuts and bolts down in your bilges. This is the way to get them. Good for finding your nuts. <laughs> That's number two. Oh yes, this one. Dentist mirror. It's just an extendable mirror. Tele on a telescopic arm. And again, this is really useful if you want to un get to a fitting in the back of a cupboard. Which you will guaranteed you will yeah. so it's just a useful way of being able to see that really important by the way in the last video we said I was gonna have root canal treatment yes and I didn't no I got it extracted it's got a big hole there where there was a tooth yes pain went though didn't it it did yes is that it that is it that is it I hope you enjoyed our top 10 11 12 then 13 essential <laughs> tools 
Uh, obviously, we would love to hear from you guys. Uh, we'd love to know what you think are the most essential. I tips. bet we missed some. I bet there's going to be a whole load of oh, things, of and we're going to go, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Put them in the comments.